Eyes for Allah, nothing but Allah. Ba is the beginning of Bismillah. Ta is for taqwa, bewaring of Allah. And tha is for thawab, a reward. Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj, the blessed pilgrimage. Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad coming to you live from Zad Studios here in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Inshallah, you will find the phone numbers displayed at the bottom of your uh, TV screens. If you have any questions, please feel free to call. Meanwhile, Tahrim sent a question. Tahrim says, I just wanted to ask what is the concept of six kalimas in Islam? And if there are no kalimas, what are those duas then for? Because people in Pakistan or India believe that a Muslim should know all kalimas, otherwise they are not proper Muslims. Please enlighten me in this regard so we can guide others too. First of all, we learn our religion from the Qur'an through following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, who came and explained to us the Qur'an, elaborated upon it, and clarified what we cannot understand due to its generalization. Now, if you look in the Qur'an, or in the Sunnah, you will not find any trace for limiting six kalima. What is kalima? Kalima in Arabic means word. And not only limited to word, it can be a phrase and it can be a sentence. So in Arabic, the word kalima can also refer to the two shahada, the testimonies that one embraces Islam by uttering and believing in them. Though they are composed of a number of words, but any statement, any sentence, any phrase can also be referred to as kalima. And a particular single word in Arabic is also kalima. So there isn't anything in the Quran or Sunnah that refers to the six kalimas, meaning not five, and that's seven. There are tens of authentic kalimas, but nowhere in the Quran or Sunnah we, where, where we will find that the Prophet or his companions told us, memorize these, and you will not be a proper Muslim if you do not memorize them or know their meaning. The Muslims in the subcontinent teach their children from an early age that the importance of these six kalimas. Part of these kalimas are part of the dhikr. So it is a fragment of a different uh, uh, a variety of dhikr, of words and statements of remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. These six kalimas, according to uh, uh, the most famous and w widely spread, al kalima tayyiba al shahada al tamjid al tawheed al istighfar and raddul kufr now if you go to these six kalimas and you analyze them some of them are in the sunnah for example la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah this is the shahada this is the first one this is known at, as al kalima al tayyiba but when you go to number 2 it says the testimony where it says I bear witness that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah. Okay, it's the same thing as the first one. And that Muhammad is his messenger, messenger and servant, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
The third one is glorification, at tamjid When you say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, allahu akbar, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, all of this is well-known, established dhikr, the best words ever to be said. The third, uh, the fourth one is tawheed. And it is the statement, la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lahu mulku, alhamdu yuhmituha, wa bi yadi al-khayru wa al-kulli shayin qadir. This is the same as the first and the second. The, four, the fifth one is istighfar. And this istighfar is something that is not found in the sunnah. Something that somebody made it up. And we know from the sunnah, the authentic sunnah, that the best seeking way of seeking forgiveness is Sayyidul Istighfar, the master of Istighfar. And it's not here. So again, who should we follow? Sunnah or these compiled words that someone had uh, 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 did, did that. And Radd al-Kufr also, it is totally not part of the sunnah. It's something that someone fabricated. Therefore, I say, these words are good but they're not from the sunnah. Why teach people something where we can find something that is better? And why limit it to six? Why not five? Why not three? Why not one? Why not ten? So I believe that maintaining and focusing and putting emphasis on such six words would amount to uh, an innovation and Allah knows best. Shuaib, I apologize for keeping you waiting. Uh, it, it's okay, it's completely okay. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How Assalamu alaikum, Allah barakatuh. Hayyak Allah, my friend. What can I do for you? Uh, Sheikh, I have three questions. I hope I can be very precise and very short. Uh, yes, sir. Inshallah. Uh, my first question is, uh, somebody actually asked me this, uh, that uh, when uh, in the Quran, wherever it is mentioned that Allah Ta'ala asked the angels to prostrate to Adam, alayhi salam, and then uh, immediately it said, uh, illa iblis. Uh, and then in, I think in Surah Kahf it is also men mentioned, Kana min al -jin. So the person asked me a question that uh, when Allah Ta'ala says uh, 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 to the angels to prostrate, in that he does not mention Iblis separately. He has asked angels to prostrate, and then he has not asked uh, Iblis to prostrate, he's only asked the angels. So why did Iblis come in the picture when it is not mentioned separately. I mean, that was the kind of the question. I just want you to elaborate on this. This is number one. Okay. Uh, number two is that uh, I read a hadith where it is said that the Prophet ﷺ said, if someone wants to increase their ranks uh, when he does wudu and in difficulty and then walks towards the masjid and then prays and then waits for the salah, uh, this is the ribat. And uh, this ribat, I think, is also mentioned in the Quran. Um, I'm not sure. I think I think it is something used for the army or the front lines. So, but what does ribat actually mean, and how is it? Uh, how is this hadith interpreted? In this hadith, what would the word mean actually? Okay. This is number two, and number three uh, is something regarding one of my friend. Uh, he is a male. He is, uh, mashallah, 32 years old, and he has had a lot of family problems, and he was also divorced recently and uh, he has lost complete confidence in himself. He feels very nervous when he's around people. Even in the job, he says, my boss says things, and he just, you know, he feels scared to answer back, or he's nervous around public. He feels scared of people. He's, like, lost complete. He prays, alhamdulillah, but he's lost, like, completely lost. He feels distracted. He feels lost in life. He does not feel focused, and he feels scared. A lot of scare. He's feeling getting on with life and starting a new life. He's, he thinks he will not, he cannot take responsibilities and he's like really, really lost. Uh, what advice would you give to such a person? Okay, Shai. I will Thanks. answer your questions. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum. First question, Brother Shaib is asking about Allah Azza wa Jal. He's telling us in Surah Al-Baqarah and elsewhere that the instruction to prostrate to Adam was addressed to the angels. And Allah tells us in Surah Al-Kahf, chapter 18, that Satan was from the jinn. So why didn't Allah Azza wa Jal address Satan directly as he addressed the angels to prostrate? Akhi, 
يعني the answer to that would probably be answered with another question. If it is as you claim, why didn't Satan object? When Allah told him, why didn't you prostrate to Adam? Why didn't he object by saying, you didn't tell me, you told the angels. He didn't say that. He acknowledged that the command was given to him as well. See, in Arabic, when you address someone or a group of people, you do not have to specifically say each and everyone's name. So when Allah Azza wa told the angels and those who were with them, and Satan knew that Allah Azza wa has elevated his status and that he is in the company of angels, and the address was to him as well. So everyone there had to prostrate. Therefore, your question is, in my, in my point of view, irrelevant because Satan did not object, which means that he understood that he was as well addressed along with the angels. As for your second question, I believe that I had answered it this morning after Fajr uh, through email, and you will get it, inshallah, tonight. And as I told you, ribat is when two armies are, uh, are anticipating a fight. They're anticipating to engage. So those at the front line, they're not engaging, but they are waiting for the right moment to someone, for someone to attack them or they would attack them. These people in a village or a town besieged by an army, those who guard it are called murabitin. They are in ribat. Those who are attacking it but not yet engaged are also in ribat. And Allah Azza wa Jal has told us that a, a, a single night in ribat, in anticipation, in guarding the army, in uh, uh, anticipating to engage with the enemy, is better than so and so years of fasting and, 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 and reward at, at the side of Allah Azza wa Jal. Now the Prophet is giving us an example, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, with waiting for the following prayer. So if you make wudu and you walk to the masjid and you pray maghrib prayer and you wait so that Isha would be called for, the time is due, the a prayer would uh, be called for and you join them. This period of waiting of an hour or so is ribat because it is like anticipating engaging the enemy army. And likewise, you're anticipating the honor of standing at the side of Allah. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Uh, his third question about his friend who lost confidence. And a lot of us may fall in the same trap of shaitan. When calamities strike, these are tests from Allah Azza wa Jal. No one on earth can escape Allah's testing. But Allah's tests to us vary. Now, the, your, your friend is a divorced and he has problems at work. He's scared to talk back to his boss. He has a, a lot of calamities. If you ask him all these cal calamities that you're having combined, would it be equal to having colon cancer or leukemia? Or would, you would, or, or would you be fine with these calamities and trials from Allah Azza wa Jal? He would tell you definitely, no. What I'm going through is far better than being a patient of cancer stage four or whatever. May Allah cure all uh, 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 our uh, ill people and loved ones. If you ask him, are these calamities okay, or would you rather be in Africa 
suffering from drought and famine, or maybe be in Syria being bombarded by the Russian army or by the uh, 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 tyrant forces being killed, being displaced, having to migrate, suffering from hunger. You don't know when someone will come and chop your neck or take your loved ones and do heinous things with them. He would say, no, what I'm having is far greater. So he, you should look at other people's suffering in order to appreciate what Allah Azza wa is testing you with, first of all. Second of all, what he is suffering from is due to lack of tawakkul, which means trust, dependence, and reliance on Allah Azza wa Jal. When we don't have this trust in Allah, we, when we do not depend on Allah, everything scares us. And this is why the Salaf used to say, whoever fears Allah, Allah will make everything else afraid of him. And whoever fears other than Allah, Allah would make everything intimidate him and make him afraid. So when you trust Allah, when you depend on Allah, when you know that Allah is your protector, your provider, you don't fear anyone else. You would have guts. I understand that people differ and we may be a bit reluctant, a bit hesitant to speak to others. No one can, out of the blue, enter a masjid and give a khutbah of Jum'ah. Maybe one in a thousand. And the rest would be intimidated. Some people would go and try to give khutbah of Jum'ah and faint as they, uh, they have reported. People coming and saying, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, Rasulullah, and they faint. It's too much for them. And there are people who have no problem in giving a khutbah of Jum'ah, and they have no shame in coming on uh, uh, God Talent or The Voice or whatever and singing their heads off. They, ha they don't even observe Allah Azza wa They could care less. They don't think that they're doing something haram because they don't even know what haram is. Therefore, my advice to your friend is, first of all, to sit with himself, acknowledge Allah's favors and blessings upon him that are numerous and without count. You cannot count them. Secondly, to trust Allah, to put all of his dependence and reliance on Allah Azza wa Jal. Thirdly, try to communicate, not to be defensive all the time, not to block yourself out of any conversation. Try to make a move. Try to push yourself a little bit. And once you cross this line of uh, uh, being reluctant and hesitant, inshallah, Azza wa you will find a big uh, uh, difference. The second question is from a sister. She says, if I do wudu, then ghusl. During ghusl, if I touch my private parts, to reach water with hand. Does this nullify my wudu? Do I have to repeat wudu for salat? First of all. Well, okay, we have Asif from India. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, sir, actually I have two questions. Uh, yes. I, in fact, uh, a question I have asked last time, just uh, some addition in that. Uh, you know, I have told that uh, actually uh, in India sometimes, you know, we are uh, surrounded by some situations in which, uh, you know, non-Muslims sometimes they try to make great problems. So as you told, we have to be patient and all, and that is okay. But sometimes, though it is very rare, but sometimes it happens that their intention is to kill us. We can do nothing. Uh, in that case, what should we do? We just, uh, we should uh, make, we should not still fight? Or uh, in that case, uh, we know that we are going to die, we can fight. I understand it happens very rarely, but uh, still this is a question. Okay. And uh, second question is regarding thob. Wearing thob or kameez, uh, you know, is it a sunnah or uh, exactly in the sunnah point of view, what is the situation? Okay. Okay. Jazak barakallah feek. Asif from India says that if we were put in a situation where the non 
Muslims, the enemies of Islam, are trying to kill us. You told us that we should try to tolerate, to be peaceful, but if someone is trying to kill us, to harm us, real good. So what should we do? You don't, be, you don't need to be a rocket scientist. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever dies while defending himself is a martyr. Whoever dies while defending his wealth, his money, is a martyr. Whoever dies defending his religion is a martyr. Whoever dies defending his honor is a martyr. So yes, if a group of people come and they intimidate you and they want to kill you, no one in his sound mind would tell you, just khalas, let them kill you. Another one bites the dust. No, defend yourself. And if you had, have to kill them all, be my guest. You are defending yourself. And this is universal. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know this. But what we were talking about previously is that Muslims are weak and they are a minority. They should not provoke such incidents. But if the incident comes to me, then definitely you have to stand up and be a real Muslim. Uh, his second question was about the sunnah of wearing the garment. This, what I'm wearing, the white uh, shirt, long shirt, it's called thawb in Arabic. But usually thawb is anything that you wear. A dress, a t-shirt, uh, a shirt, it's thawb, something that covers you. And he's saying qamis. Qamis is a shirt in Arabic. So he's saying, is it a sunnah? The answer is yes and no. It is a cultural thing. So if I'm in, living in the States, would I wear this? The answer is no. I'd wear like everybody else is wearing. I won't be wearing a tux, for example, but I would wear a, a normal suit like everybody else. I would look like everyone else without imitating the disbelievers. Because wearing such a thobe in a place where people are not used to it would cause more harm than good. And there isn't anything in the Sunnah that states that the Prophet ﷺ ordered us to wear such a particular dress. There, are, there is a dress code that it shouldn't be tight, that it shouldn't be see-through, that it shouldn't exceed the ankles, that it shouldn't imitate the women, uh, that the opposite gender, that it shouldn't uh, exceed, um, uh, imitate the disbelievers, etc. But not to wear this or to wear a thobe or, yes, wearing white is part of the Sunnah. Other than that, it's a cultural thing. And whoever claims that it is a sunnah just because the Prophet did it, والسلام, then we might as well say that going to work riding a mule is a sunnah because the Prophet did that to Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have a short break. Stay tuned. And inshallah, we'll be right back. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, No one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. After which Abu Bakr began to weep and say, And is my life and wealth for anything besides you, O Messenger of Allah? This narration shows the level of etiquette and humbleness that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, had in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. For he likened himself to a slave of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam by saying that his wealth was only for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well as his soul and self. This comes as no surprise for the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has more right on the believers than themselves. He, may Allah be pleased with him, spent his wealth in the cause of Allah and he consoled the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. 
through his own self. So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognized that for him and said in order to build his stature and to remind the Ummah of his virtues, no one's wealth helped me as much as the wealth of Abu Bakr helped me. Among the benefits of this narration, it is important to keep good manners and humbleness in the presence of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, thanking someone who has bestowed some favor on you, as well as supplicating for them is part of having good manners. Reported by Al-Bukhari, reported by Al-Tirmidhi, and Ibn Majah, Albani ruled it authentic in his book Sahih Al-Jami'. The explanation of a sindi on the book of Ibn Majah and at Taysir Bisharh al Jami' al Sagir. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Just before the break, we had a chance to read the question of a sister. Her question was, if while doing ghusl, I happen to touch my private part while cleaning myself, would I have to perform another wudu afterwards or not? First of all, we are presuming that this ghusl is to uplift a major impurity. A ritual impurity, whether it's due to um, menses or to sexual intercourse. So this is our first assumption. Because if she was, or he was, taking a shower just to clean himself up, then we say, yes, you have to make wudu in the sequence known. The face, the arms, the, the wiping of the head, and washing of the feet. Because this order has to be followed. If you are taking a full ritual, major uh, uh, ritual bath, you do not require this sequence. Because wudu is a small impurity, a, a small form of purity goes underneath the bigger form of purity, which is ghusl. So number one, she is performing a ghusl to uplift a major ritual impurity. Number two, it's a difference of opinion among scholars whether touching a person's private part invalidates the wudu or not. And the reason is the presence of two contradicting hadith on the surface. And the scholars, some of them said that one abrogates the other. And some said, we don't know which one came before the other. And another group said, well, we know that the default is that touching your body does not nullify your wudu. So touching any part of it afterwards means that this abrogates the old default. And some went into a compromise by saying that touching your private parts does not invalidate your wudu unless it is touched with desire and lust. So if we follow this last opinion, and it might be, inshallah, yani the most appropriate in the sense that it makes things easier, especially when there is a mixed opinion among scholars regarding this issue. If we follow this opinion, then your ghusl is valid without any doubt, but your wudu is valid as well. My personal advice would be to follow the sunnah when you make ghusl. Therefore, you do not need this. The sunnah is that you first of all wash your hands three times, then you wash your private part at the very beginning, then you wash your hands again from any dirt that might have stuck into it, and then you perform wudu without washing your feet, then you pour uh, uh, three scoops of water on your head, ensuring that the water reaches your scalp, then washing the rest of your body. At the end, you wash your feet, voila, it's over. This is a sunnah. So you make sure that you did not touch your private part in the process, and Allah Azza wa knows best. 
uh, Rashid says, if one has the intention of performing one rak'ah witr before the start of this prayer, but then while he was praying, he adds another two rak'ahs to make it three units instead. Is this okay? The answer is no. Your intention in the beginning was to pray one rak'ah. Now, you wandered a little bit away from Salat, and all of a sudden you find yourself in the second rak'ah reciting the Fatiha. You said, hmm, wow, this is second rak'ah, what should I do? What a waste. Let me finish three rak'ahs with her. No, this is not valid. The moment you realize that you've prayed a second rak'ah or a third rak'ah, you should immediately sit for tashahud because the second and the third are void. What you intended for was one. The same thing happens to a lot of the Muslims when they are praying night prayer, for example, two rak'ahs, and they find themselves in the third rak'ah. So they said, what the heck? Let's complete four. This is not permissible. This is what you intended to do in the beginning, which is two. You must stick to that. You, Rashid, intended one rak'ah witr. You must stick to that, and Allah knows best. Raid says, a tradition here, people say you can close, you can lock, or you can circle a house or a property by verses and stuff too. So to keep the property or house off limit to jinn. Is this allowed or even sahih? Well, I don't know of such a security system that locks or circles the house like you have this, uh, described. What I know is that if a person enters his home at night and closes the door saying, Bismillah, the devils say to one another, you don't have a place to spend the night in. And if they sit, that is the, the, the humans, to eat and say, Bismillah, the, the devils say, you have no place to eat nor to sleep. And if a person does not say Bismillah, they invite one another to come and have a meal and they invite one another to spend the night in the house. So saying Bismillah when you close the door blocks the way for the jinn from entering. Also reciting the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number two. Amana al bima unzili ilayhi min rabbihi wal mu'minun. To the end. The Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, that it prevents the devils from entering your home for three nights. Reciting the whole surah also prevents the devils from entering your house, but it does not limit it to a period of time. So we don't know how long, but we know that it is effective. So when you move to a new home, you should recite the, fa the, the surah, al-Baqarah, the whole thing. But every single night, part of the athkar of going to bed, that you recite the last two ayahs and this would lock your house, inshallah, in the face of uh, uh, the jinn. Other than that, I personally do not know uh, anything else. Uh, a sister says, in my house, without the permission of my husband, none mahram males get into private chambers. What should I do if advising my husband is not working? The sister is quite ambiguous. If she's referring to her own bedroom, and probably she is referring to in-laws creeping into her bedrooms without the knowledge or the permission of her husband, but he's failing to make a stand. He's failing to tell them not to do this. This is problematic because your, has, your husband has to man up. This is not something that men usually accept and shrug their shoulders and move on. 
No one should enter your bedroom without your permission. And especially if non-mahrams enter and they may see something you or your wife would not like others to see. This is your private chambers. But if you're referring to you being out of the home and your husband is inside the home and he admits his brother, his cousin, and he's sitting in the bedroom and there's nothing wrong in the bedroom that you may be ashamed of, nothing hanging or dangling. In this case, there's nothing wrong in that, inshallah. But you may communicate with your husband and tell him that if you want to sit with these non-mahram men, I'd feel much more comfortable for you to sit with them elsewhere other than my own bedroom. But this is something that you have to work out uh, through communication. Zainab says, is praising someone sinful in Islam? What if someone praises his or her brother in Islam for encouragement or out of love? Now, you cannot answer this without details. Praising people depends on the impact it has upon, upon others. So, for example, we find that the Prophet والسلام, praised in many cases a number of his companions. He praised Abu Bakr, as you may have heard in the commercial uh, during the break, if, it, if we can say it's commercial, if it's, it's a, a, a piece of information about Abu Bakr and how he was the most useful to the Prophet ﷺ through his wealth. He praised Umar for his strength. He praised Uthman for his generosity. He praised so many companions of the Prophet ﷺ. May Allah be pleased with them all. So this is okay if we can guarantee and ensure that the person I'm praising's heart would not be affected negatively. But also, the Prophet ﷺ witnessed a man praising someone in his face. So two people were talking, and one of them was saying, Oh, my friend, you are the most pious, the most generous, the most caring and loving. I've never seen anyone walk the earth like you. And the other one was listening. His head was probably growing and growing like a balloon uh, 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 soon to be burst out. So the Prophet said, salam, said to the man who was praising him, said, Wayhaka, laqad wajata unuqa akhik. Meaning that you have slaughtered your brother with what you're saying. Because such praise would only be infested by shaitan, by the devils, putting whispers and ideas in, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like there. Someone comes to me and say, Shaykh, you're so and so and so. And I said, Astaghfirullah. Inside I would say, I'm more than that. Ibn al-Jawzi, may Allah have mercy on his soul, said, I went with a friend of mine to one of the masjids in Al-Kufa, in Iraq. And we went after midnight. And the masjid was empty, except for one person who was praying night prayer, with a small candle next to him, so... I was whispering to my friend, Masha Allah, look how beautiful this man's prayer is. So much submissiveness, so much concentration. It so happened that the man heard it. So he concluded his prayer quickly, and then he came to them. And he said, proudly, you like my prayer? What would you say if you were to know that I've been fasting for the past 20 years? Ibn al-Jawzi explains in his beautiful book, Sayyid al-Khatr, he explains and says, look at this stupid person, this imbecile. He has totally wavered his good deeds by exposing it in such a way. You've deleted your good deeds by exposing it to others. So when you are praised, then the one who's praising you is doing you harm. 
And this is why the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, احثو التراب في وجوه المدحين. That you should take dust and whenever someone praises it, throw it in his face. Because he's harming you more than benefiting you. I don't need people to come and praise me. Therefore, you have to be balanced. And this is why when you want to speak about the third person, so the, we are, both of us are talking about Abdullah. Abdullah is not there. So I'm saying Abdullah is one heck of a guy. He is, mashallah, righteous, knowledgeable. And I have to add this phrase, Wala uzakkihi ala Allah. I do not praise him before Allah. Wallahu hasibuhu. Allah is, is his, uh, 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 the one who holds him to account. Why do I put this disclaimer? So that I would not say something and it would be wrong as if I'm praising him before Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah knows who is righteous and who is not. Therefore, you have to strike this balance and it's a very uh, a fine thread. Jobadul, I think his name. He says, I heard someone saying that Ibn Kathir mentioned in Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, volume number 14, that after Ibn Taymiyyah died, before giving ghusl, people recited Quran and kissed him, men and women, for barakah. And the water they used for ghusl, people drank it. And so many other bid'as and shirk happened. Was it true? Or Ibn Kathir was wrong? Or the guy who is saying this is uh, uh, deviant? First of all, this was mentioned in Al-Bidawa al nihaya of Ibn Kathir. Al-Bidawa al nihaya is a history book. It's composed of like 20 volumes, I think. I'm, 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 I don't recall it now. It's, it's, it's huge. And it talks about from the time of Adam, as if there were anyone to report it, from the time of Adam, of Noah, of Abraham, etc. It has all details of little things that took place, which no one was there, but this is history. And knowledge is not taken from books of history. This is point one. Point two, Ibn Taymiyyah himself, may Allah have mercy on his soul, was one of the greatest scholars of all times. He was so forcefully attacking and rejecting innovation. Anything that draws people close to shirk. He was protecting the tawheed. And he would never approve or had approved any of these acts mentioned. Thirdly, none of those who had performed these innovations, such as reciting the Quran, kissing the dead body of women to a dead person, who does this? Seeking blessing through kissing him? Or even drinking the water after washing him? What nonsense is this? None of his students had done this or approved it. And the laymen do more heinous things than this. So whatever was reported and done was not done by the approval or acknowledgement of Shaykh al-Islam bin Taymiyyah because he was dead. Now the issue is, why didn't Ibn Kathir comment on such practices? I don't know, and personally, I don't care. See, we do not take our religion from Ibn Taymiyyah or Ibn Kathir or Imam al-Zahabi or Tom, Dick or Harry. They are great scholars of Islam. We put them on the top of our heads and we are not even equivalent to their toe fingernail. They have vast knowledge, but the religion of Allah Azza wa is greater than them all. And Allah tells us that whenever there's a dispute, refer back to the Quran and to the Sunnah. فَإِنْتَنَزَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ Return it back to Allah and to His Messenger وسلم, to the Quran and to the Sunnah. So whatever was mentioned by Ibn Kathir is unacceptable. 
Why didn't he comment? Allahu alam. Yet he is not, that is Ibn Kathir, considered to be from the Salaf because he was in the 8th century Hijrah. And we know that the righteous predecessors are the first three generations. The generation of the Sahaba, of the Tabi'een, and of the Tabi'i Tabi'een. Therefore, those who circulate such a quote while ignoring the whole iceberg. This quote is at the tip of an iceberg, but there's a whole iceberg that condemns shirk, that condemns innovation, that talks clearly about these practices and how they do not relate to Islam. Not only that, that they even invalidate Islam. So those who quote it definitely have illness in their hearts because they've neglected all the teachings of Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah and came to an incident that happened after his death. What do you want him to do? To rise from the dead and say, listen, this is bid'ah, this is innovation, what are you doing? This is not logical and Allah knows best. Saqib says in a check, if a check bounces or in a check bounce case, if the court forces my debtor to pay more than what he owes me as a punishment, would it be permissible for me to take this additional money? What you are entitled for is what you had lent. And it would be considered as riba. This court is not Islamic. And hence, they do not have the power to cross the line. So even if they gave you and sentenced him to pay you more than the actual loan, you should take the extra and give it back to him and Allah knows best. Fariha says, I want to know if ghusl is required, but due to illness, I cannot take the whole bath. Will wudu be enough to purify myself? This depends. If you're able to wash the majority of your body, but there is a specific area where you cannot, due to the impossibility of water coming to it, or the prevention of doctors' water from touching it, in this case, the verdict is that you perform your ghusl as normal, but when it comes to the area that is restricted, if there is a plaster uh, or a cast on it, then you wipe over that, and this is sufficient. If not, then you must perform tayammum. So you wash your whole body except that particular area, and then you, you make tayammum, dry ablution, and wipe your face and wipe your hands, and that's it, for skipping washing that area. If you are unable to use water altogether for your whole body, in this case, due to, for example, uh, um, being too cold, the, the water is too cold, and if you put water on yourself, you will definitely uh, uh, feel sick, uh, fall, fall sick, or um, be harmed. In this case, you cannot make wudu instead of ghusl. You have to make tayammum, as mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah and Surah An-Nisa as well. And Allah knows best. A brother says, how can I reduce my sexual desire to the lowest level? I think of it a lot and it's uh, affecting me. I know the Prophet ﷺ recommended fasting, but I have ulcer. So the doctor advised me not to fast often. And I am not married yet. What can I do, please? Yaqi, you don't put me in a corner and ask me to find a way out for you. You have to improvise. The Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, O people, who, uh, uh, the youth, whoever has the ability to get married must get married. So you're telling me I cannot get married. This is pr problem number one. Maybe you can get married, but you're putting hurdles of your own. So you can get married to someone who is 15 or 20 years older than you. They, they would accept you. 
you can get married to someone who is not as to the level of your standards in beauty or wealth. But again, this would protect you from falling into haram. So you can think of solutions. If you're unable to marry at all, then you have to fast. Simple as that. You say, I cannot fast all the time. Um, they did not, do not recommend you to fast often. Okay, then don't fast often, but fast every now and then. This reduces your uh, uh, sexual drive. And most importantly, you have to lower your gaze. You wouldn't have any problem if you did not watch movies, TV series, WhatsApp, YouTube, social media, Instagram, Snapchat, etc. But the more addictive you are, the more addicted you are to these uh, uh, um, forms of media, the more tempted you are to fall into sin. So you have to, if you're sincere, cut, take out the internet from your home, take out the TV uh, uh, set altogether, and lower your gaze whenever you're out. Do not mix with females. Do not just sit there and enjoy the scene, because this is how shaitan uh, um, comes and creeps into your heart. This is how he infiltrates your defense system because you've opened all means to be invaded and you're inviting him in. So once you do this, inshallah, you would find it easy to uh, um, counterattack with the grace of Allah. This is all the time we have. Until we meet same time next week, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Eyes for Allah, nothing but Allah. Ba is the beginning of Bismillah. Ta is for taqwa, bewaring of Allah. And tha is for thawab, a reward. Ja is for Jannah, the garden of paradise. Ha is for Hajj. The blessed pilgrimage, Kha is for Khatim, the seal of the prophethood given to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.